Benjamin Castle are Americans. Watching the footy. Liam Ryan saying kick it my way. I want to jump over the pack and here he comes. Oh, Ryan! This is Buddy Franklin! This is the greatest showman! Got the handball off to Myers. Myers looking for the lead of Stengel. Gee, they're good. Gee, they're sharp. Randall Dazzarioli. Oh, who else? McDonald. Tim From inside the centre square. Welcome to episode 102 of Americans Watching the Footy. I am Benjamin Castle. Hello, some. I am Ethan Castle. Wow. Who are you leaving out of some? Or do they just have to figure it out? They'll know. They'll know who's being left out. We're not exactly at the midpoint of the season yet, but the midseason draft is happening tonight, a little bit after we record this, and the buys have started, so it's close enough, and we're going back to our progress reports like we did last year, so... These will be for the teams that are on the buys each week. We'll give a mid-season assessment of them, a little bit of preview of what's ahead, and we do that all in random order rather than just going like alphabetically or in ladder order, so you don't know when we're going to talk about your team unless you just, you know, check the timestamps. Oh, I'm not even going to provide timestamps for these. Good, screw our listeners. They don't deserve your consideration, and I don't want to waste any more time. Should we get right into things, Ethan? I was just thinking about... I guess the halfway point of the season occurs somewhere in the middle of the next round. Uh, it would be game five of the next round, yes? There are 207 games. 216 counting finals. Okay, well, if we're just talking the midpoint of the home and away season, then it would be the halfway point of game number 104, which would be the fifth game of this round. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it would be. So when we hit halftime of Giants-Tigers, that's, that's halftime on the whole season. All right, let's make like Nicki Minaj and get it cracking like a bad back. So the four teams that are off this week are Brisbane, Frio, St. Kilda, and Sydney. And we're just going to click the button and wheel whatever sound effect. I don't know. Well, we're keeping alphabetical to start, I guess, because the Brisbane Lions are up first. They currently sit in third at eight and three with a percentage of almost 125. They remain perfect at home and had been on a seven-game win streak before losing to the Crows heading into this bye. They're also the only team to beat Collingwood, although I thought the Pies were still a chance in that one. They are still a chance, actually, right now, at 11.33 p.m. on Tuesday, May 30th. So yeah, their losses are at Port, at the Bulldogs, and at Adelaide. I, at the start of the year, saw this as a flag contender. My pick was for them to win it over, I think, Sydney? And I said Brisbane over... Melbourne, I believe. I'm still liking Brisbane to be one of the final four. They figured out, well, I would say that they had figured out things defensively, but last week suggested maybe not as much past their best 22 there. Here's the thing that holds me back on them. Their forward line's great and their midfield is great, but we look at the teams that have won flags in the last few years and defense has won championships. Oh, it's not just that. It's just... If you compare, like, who's going to be in your defense versus any recent grand final winner, it makes this Brisbane defense look bad. Like, it's still a solid defensive unit. Harris Andrews is playing much better this year, getting back toward all Australian territory. As of late, Jack Payne has had an excellent past month or so playing a variety of roles, but he was out last week, this past Sunday, against the Crows, and it showed because my sleeper pick, Ryan Lester, could not keep up with the man assignments nearly as well. Honestly, I think the bigger concern out of that game is how much Daniel Rich struggled on kickouts, and normally he's a guy who's able to play in wet conditions because it's kind of always wet at the Gabba. Always humid, not really too rainy a lot of the time. There's at least moisture on the ball, and that's a concern. But a bit more about Lester because he's someone that I'd highlighted to start the year He's played each of the last five games, and it's been his run and carry out of the back that I've liked best about him. He's not a good one-on-one -on -one defender at this point. He is already 30 years old, and someone of his body type, 
you're expecting them to handle opposing tall forwards one on one. Could not do that this past week. My pick was Harry Sharp, who played in three straight games, rounds eight to ten, the wins over Carlton, Essendon, and the Suns, though he was subbed out against the Suns. Uh, he's been he's been fine. He's got a couple goals, averaging a little over thirteen disposals a game. It was just picking Will Ashcroft would have been cheating. So that's why I picked him. And we weren't expecting Shadow Brain to make an appearance yet, and he has not. Which is which is really unfortunate. But my biggest concern with them is Kadeen Coleman's going to need to get back towards the trajectory he was on last year. It looked, he was one of their, he was really their only good defender last week. I mean, Andrews was limited to five touches. And I thought Andrews would try to get more involved by maybe taking some of those kick-ins once Rich struggled. We've seen him do that. But whether Coleman's marking on the wing or serving as the guy to take it out of the goal square, I think he's returning back to form. And that's one of the reasons I think they can still be a flag team. I just, I don't know if their defense would be able to hold up against the best of them. The other concern is, you know, we're expecting some of their injury luck to reverse at some point. They stayed relatively healthy the past year and a half. And while Noah Answorth and Jack Payne are concussed, they should both return after the bye. Should also note that Dane Zorka will be suspended coming out of the bye. He'll be out against Hawthorne, a team against whom the Lions lost last year, though. This one will be at the G. Ooh, Hawthorne versus Brisbane is going to be interesting after uh, the investigation into them wrapped up. Of course, Chris Fagan was one of the main figures in that, and he finally released a statement about it. Also, Jack Gunston playing against his old club. Things that I, I would imagine he gets cheered rather than booed. Uh, I don't know. I think it's pretty automatic that you get booed at this point, even if you were successful with your other club. Seemed like he left on pretty good terms, so I, I don't know. Considering where the Lions finished last year, you knew their schedule wouldn't be easy. They've got a pretty tough stretch coming home. Looking at the last seven rounds, really, nothing looks easy at this point. At Melbourne, round 18. Geelong, round 19. At the Suns for Q Clash, 25. At Frio, hosting the Crows. At Collingwood and finishing up with St. Kilda. The other thing I like about Brisbane is that they're able to play at a variety of tempos. They can bleed out the clock when they need to, though they are still better when they're going faster. I am going to ask the same question about every one of these teams. What does each team, you know, what do the Lions have to do for you to consider this season a success? Make the grand final, although if we, do, I don't like the, that super deterministic thing. However, that's been the big hurdle for them. They've gotten over the finals and MCG curses is last year. The next step still needs to be taken. They've got the four, two thirds for it. If Payne continues his form and Colin gets back to it, I think they can go further. And speaking of the forwards, I like how we mentioned this before. You never know which of their forwards it's going to be week in and week out. I think this was a subject of one of the ABC articles as well from Cody Atkinson and Sean Lawson. Those are always great reads, by the way, from those two. It's stat driven and it's presented really well. The graphics they use are really good. Eric Hipwood was a little quiet last week, but he started to get back into form. I think that was just a just an off game for him. I think it was an off game for it was an off game for a lot of them. It was not for Charlie Cameron. He was awesome. He kicked four against his former team. But I'm gonna say they've got to reach a prelim again. Maybe make the grand final. Definitely reach a prelim. From there, you know, there's always a chance when you get that deep that you just get beat where you don't do anything to lose and you just get beat by a team having a great game. That happened to Collingwood in both their finals last year. So, yeah, I wouldn't quite go as far as, you know, they have to reach the grand final, but at the very least, they're going to have to make a fr make a prelim for sure. The grand final, one of the next two years, I'll say, looking longer term. Yeah, it would be tough for them to come out of this window and say, and, you know, have no, you know, not even a grand final appearance to show for it with, how much talent they have, and how many guys are in their prime right now. I really want to make a Port Adelaide joke right now. I just don't know which one to make. It would be very Hinkley-like for Chris Fagan to not get to a grand final. So let's see who's next up. One down, three to go. And we're staying alphabetical. Frio. Dockers are six and five. They currently sit in ninth at the time of recording. Their percentage right now is just a tick above 100, 102.3. They started 1-3, they fell to 2-5, and five, 
But in that loss to the Lions that dropped under two and five, I thought despite getting their asses kicked and playing poorly defensively, they found their identity. They started taking it up the corridor and just kind of trying to run with teams instead of play the slow kick mark game. They just they kind of returned to a lot of what worked last year. And then in subsequent weeks, looking at especially that win at the SCG, they found their forward lines. Jai Amos has continued to stay strong. He did get the Rising Star nomination for round 11 at last with another three-goal performance against the D's. Josh Tracy's inclusion is making more and more sense, and Luke Jackson's versatility is really starting to show between the time he can still spend in the ruck, being able to neutralize Max Gaughan and Brody Grundy this past week, and as the center half forward that we expected him to be. I know that they were trying to shoehorn him into a bit of into a bit more of a midfield role, attending some more center bounces. That didn't quite pan out. He's playing more of his natural game now. Josh Tracy really broke out in that Sydney game with 14 disposals and a pair of goals, nine contested possessions. Only had four touches against Geelong, but still just like there's at least one play every week. And I've said this in past episodes where someone gets a goal because the defenders all kind of converge around Tracy and it leaves someone else open. Against Melbourne, he had nine disposals, a couple of goals, and he ended up taking a couple hitouts as well. Yeah, he was forced into that because of Sean Darcy's injury. Darcy suffered a moderate hamstring injury. We don't have a clear timeline on it yet, but I'd imagine anywhere between three and six weeks on that. They remain Pretty healthy otherwise. Keith Chapman is dealing with his own hamstring injury and has a four to six week timeline. Jay Romero suspension. They've had pretty good health. You know, Matt Tabner being out, I've said it's an unfortunate what if he stayed healthy because you know, he had a seven goal game last year, I think it was. And you think about just how great his numbers would be if he had been blessed with better health. But at this point, it's not worth playing him. I hope he's able to make a comeback someday. Maybe it'll have to be with another club. I mean, he is from Victoria, so unless he really loves being in Perth, that at least opens some doors for him. But given his injury history and the fact that he turns 30 in under three weeks' time, I would completely understand why clubs would be passing on him. He's never played more than 17 games in the season. The closest he ever came to playing the full season was playing 16 games in 2020. But I think this team has found their identity. You know, I was really concerned a few weeks into the season. And now, I mean, I, I don't get why it took them as long as it did to realize, wait, this worked last year. We still have a lot of the pieces that could make that work. Maybe they were freaked out by losing as many players as they did because they did enter the season without a couple of their most important players from last year, giving up Blake Akers for absolutely fucking nothing. Third rounder. And Griffin Logan Darcy Tucker were traded away to North. See, that trade I understood. The the Acres trade I still don't get. But they're starting to develop a new look on the wing. I mean, on the older side, you got my sleeper pick, Ethan Hughes. Tends to average in the teens in disposals. Was moved into a bit more of a halfback role before getting that center wing assignment again in recent weeks. And the Dockers have looked better for it. Of course, on the younger side in the wings, you've got the player outside of Geelong that you might like the most in Nathan O'Driscoll. You've been very high on him from the very beginning. I don't know if he's a guy I liked the most, but I can just lay claim to being one of the people who was like, hey, this guy's good. The way they've used him this year has been interesting. It's been kind of like in slower sequences, kick mark sequences out on the wing, but I like what he's done still. And I think he's going to be a part of their game for a long time and hopefully you get some Good matchups between him and Max Holmes. Holmes had to play towards the middle when the teams met a couple weeks ago because, like, the whole Geelong midfield was hurt. And then he got hurt. Yeah. It sounds like he's already running some, so his recovery time is going to be faster than the usual meniscus. Maybe it's a small tear. I don't know. Uh, my sleeper for this year is Neil Erasmus, who's played in three games this season. I didn't, he's Australian, but he was born in South Africa. Been subbed in once, been subbed out once. I think those kind of... I think the time he was subbed out was like a planned thing was how to get Nat Fife in the game. And that's been another subtext to this season for the Dockers is Fife coming back from injuries and now really getting up to speed. I think I said this in the round recap that we just put out 
he looked the most knack fight that he's looked in the win against the D's. First time he'd gotten to 20 disposals, laid a couple tackles as well, was back in some of that pressuring role that we'd really liked him being in. It was the first time that he had played a full game since round one. I don't think it's entirely a coincidence that they're four and one this year when he's played. Last year, they were four and two with the draw when he played, but I don't think he's the make or break guy. I think it's sentimental more than anything to have him in there. I think they'd be able to adjust to life without him. It's just more fun to have success with the guy who's been there for so long and been, you know, a club icon. Who is the make or break guy for them when you say, when you say someone like Lockie Schultz, maybe? Could it be him? Could go Michael Frederick? Could go Luke Jackson now? He's figured it out and they figured it out, you know, in terms of how to deploy him. You knew there would be a bit of an adjustment period going to a very different system from which he had been in under Simon Goodwin. He's found himself now. Schultz has kicked a goal in all but one game. He won goals against the Lions, but has kicked 17-8 on the year. I've said it a bunch of times. If he was playing in Victoria, there would be a lot more talk about him. I think you had, you would have seen his jumper everywhere had he played for a Victorian club. Looking down the road... Their round 16 to 21 schedule is pretty tough. Bulldogs away, Carlson at home, Collingwood away, Sydney home, at Geelong, Brisbane. So, you know, you're flying to Victoria every other week. All of those games look tough on paper unless the Swans are still struggling with health. Even then, you know, there's a chance the Swans have their shit together to an extent by that time. Actually, yeah, and Carlson, I mean, I think think by then they'll figure something out they can't be much worse could they i don't think they could get worse i mean with all the injuries they caught this past week there is potential for anything it would be funny as shit if it did get worse and they just kick like 113 for a, for a whole game or something fuck it goalless blues ethan i'm gonna ask you first this time what do frio need to do in order for this season to be a success i think at this point, now that we've seen them get their shit together, I think just win a final. I, I think that's enough because it would put them on par with where they were last year, despite, I think, setting their sights a bit further down the road. Like, if you still had Blake Akers, I would say they'd need to do more than last year, but because of what they've done with their list, I think just make finals, win one final, and you've had a year that makes me think you're still on track and Flag Mantle can become a thing sooner rather than later. Oh yeah, just realized we didn't even mention that Rory Lobb isn't there anymore. And, uh, you know, that was kind of important that he is a bulldog now, considering they lost their shit when he came back. Yeah, they that was a night that I thought they looked screwed because they were so focused on him instead of actually, you know, playing the game, period. I like the finals win assessment. If they stay the course strategically, keep going with the faster pace, allow Bailey Banfield to continue playing, they can definitely win another final. I'd back them in to win a road final at this point. When they lost that game, the just when they they looked so immature, that that was an acceptable time to start thinking, shit, I don't know if this team could be a finalist. Now I am, you know, I'm back on the train. We're starting to hear that magic word again, flag mantle, and I, I get why. We're already halfway done, so that means it's time for a quick break. Back in a moment. You know, Benjamin, 78% of our listeners are between 18 and 35 years old, so they probably want to start a podcast like we did. How did you know that number, Ethan? Thanks to the analytics we have for Spotify for podcasters. Formerly known as Anchor, sorry for your fans, Spotify for Podcasters has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer. No fancy software needed. It's so easy you can edit it while drunk. And Spotify for Podcasters doesn't just allow you to upload to Spotify. You can also distribute your podcast on platforms like Apple, Stitcher, and more just like we do. Best of all, it's completely free. Not only is it free, you can even make money from listener support or ad revenue. Hint, hint. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to podcasters.spotify.com to get started today. Don't forget, we're on Twitter at Americans Footy. We're on YouTube at Americans Footy as well. More shorts in the coming weeks. Brian Harambe is on Instagram at Cat Named Brian. He's just been sitting in the windowsill for 
pretty much the entire duration of this episode. He's been listening to our podcast in the windowsill. Care to join him? I am on Twitter at Castle Media. That's Castle with a K. I've said that so many times. If you, if you don't get it by now, you're just not listening. Also, I'm at BenjaminHK01 on Twitter, so that's even more of a hint. Amazing how many people have misspelled and continue to misspell our surname. All right. We only have one more time to spin the wheel of prizes this episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ryan's looking. Yeah, Ryan came out of the window still just now, jumped out, wondering what in the world they're doing. I'll, I'll, I'll just move North Korea. I'll just start talking about the Sydney Swans, who are 5-6 and six in 11th with a percentage of 101.2. They had lost 6 of 7 after a 2-0 start. They had gotten really banged up in that time, and it hasn't gotten much better, though they have won their last two. A dramatic interchange breach field win against North and an outclassing of the Blues this past Friday. Their losses at Melbourne, Port Adelaide, at Geelong in a humiliating grand final rematch. It was worse by margin. A dramatic Sydney Derby 25 loss where Toby Green, not entirely healthy, played the hero, and at Collingwood. Let's remember, despite everything that's gone wrong, this team is incredibly close to being 7-4, and four, hence why I think they're still in decent shape, but the injuries, uh, a lot of them. Yeah, Joel Amardi did his hamstring... He was playing out of his mind to start the year. He appears to be two to four weeks out, so best case scenario, he could be back right after the bye. Peter Laddams has what looked like a pretty serious ankle injury from landing on Todd Goldstein. That's going to hold him out. We don't, we don't know the timetable yet, but it's basically up to Tom Hickey and maybe Lachlan McAndrew. We also don't know the timeline on Tom McCartan, with his concussion issues, though we know now that Patty will not play again this year, he's been put onto the inactive list, and that will give Sydney a midseason pick. After having great health last year, it's really hit him this year. Logan McDonald hurt his ankle. Callum Mills is dealing with a calf injury that should keep him out another two to four weeks. Sam Reed's hamstring injury has him out for the year. Dane Rampey's only a week or two from coming back with his neck injury. That that should help them significantly because I just see him as a guy who knows how to win games like the list of guys I want on my team in a late close game situation other than like just the entire Collingwood team would have to include Rampy and James Robottom. Robottom is someone whose performance has hardly slipped no matter how well or how poorly the team has played. I mean he's gotten the same number of touches but he hasn't been as involved off those stoppages as much lately and actually I've seen some Swans fans not be as pleased with his performance. His worst tackling performance this year is four. He's had four double-digit tackle performances and four six-tackle games. So I I like him. I just think, oh, I, I'm like the grittiest player around. I like him too, but you can't make an entire career off tackles, as Sam Barry of the Crows has learned. As Brian joins Ethan on his bed, I also remind you that Matt Roberts is dealing with a knee injury and Mark Sheather, who debuted, I believe, as a sub in the Sydney Derby, has a foot problem as well. They've had tons of injuries to tall defenders and tall forwards. Buddy was banged up for a bit. He played one time despite being very ill during the week. I believe it was their game against Richmond during the Gather round. where they really utilized their small forwards after a couple of injuries. Oh, who was it? Hang on, I gotta... That was the game where Amardi got hurt. He had kicked two goals in the first half before suffering that hamstring injury, and we knew it right away watching it. I was watching that before heading into work early Friday morning and saw it. I was like, oh, fuck, really? This is gonna be one of the last things I see before going in? That was just terrible to watch. They did win that game. They did, but it's been a lot tougher to adapt to not having the tall defenders. You can live without good tall forwards. It's not ideal, but you can manage. You gotta have a couple tall defenders. Well, Lewis Melikin coming in this past week helped a lot because it freed up Nick Blakey to be the lizard we know him to be. Yeah, Nick Blakey trying to play as a tall defender, like, that's not his fault that he's not good at it. No, just you're asking a guy to do something that doesn't fit his skill set at all. 
So Melkin has been a really important piece there. For now, I'd say have him and Rampy in, especially with both McCartans out. That could be the real solution there going forward. And they presented more forward options as well. Sam Wicks came in and scored a couple this past week, so they're pretty deep. I also like what my sleeper pick has done this year. Mine was Hayden McLean. I really liked him the last couple weeks, especially. Yeah, he did kick that uh, interchange breach fueled game winner. Hardest goal he's ever kicked. Probably the strangest. Had to kick it like straight on from a couple meters out. I think even Harry Mackay would finish that one. Ooh, that's debatable. He scored seven goals in the last five games. Has been pretty reliable for a goal or two since late in 2021, I'd say. Hasn't ever put up a huge bag. Hasn't ever had more than four in a game. That actually came against the Cats in 2021, a game that you would like to forget. Yeah, the two most recent trips to the SCG did not go well. I'd, I'd love a win there this year. Well, that'll be in round 16, which is the start of a pretty uh difficult last nine-game stretch for him. Honestly, I mean, the Richmond matchup doesn't look as difficult anymore, and they tend to actually play all right at the show round for Sydney Derby. Yeah, more of their struggles have come at home. I'm looking forward to that, though, just because... It's Sydney Derby on a Saturday night. It's a chance to actually see a pretty big crowd hopefully fill the showground. It won't be. I mean, like, I, I hope they sell it out. I don't know if they will. They won't. I hope they find a way to. The only way the Giants would sell out a Sydney Derby is if it were in Canberra. Well, then you'd also have the Tom Green fan club at your disposal. Whenever I hear somebody saying at their disposal or something like that for footy, I'm thinking that the pun is intended. I know it wasn't there, but there's that. But McLean has been an important role player in the forward line, especially with the injuries. So he and Wicks will be focus points over these next few weeks before Logan McDonald and Joel Marty come back in. Errol Golden is another one who is a really smart ball user, and even though he's definitely more of a midfielder, has been taking more shots on goal lately, has scored five goals in the last five games. See, I think of Golden being kind of like a link between the defenders and the midfielders usually. Like, where do I envision him playing? Yeah, I can see that with Chad Warner being the link between the midfielders and the forwards, but everybody's had to pitch in more in the forward lines, especially since McDonald went down. My pick was Angus Sheldrick just because he's 19, so still young enough to date Leo DiCaprio. Uh, oh, by the way, Al Pacino's girlfriend is pregnant, according to TMZ. He's 82. She's 29. Why the fuck do we give famous people a platform? Shelbrick's played in two games this year, subbed out of one, subbed into another. Hasn't really done a ton, so maybe he'll factor in more as the year goes on. Maybe he's just not ready yet. Got a lot to learn about him. Yeah, it's, it's you know, that he hasn't really factored in much despite the injuries they've had. Makes me think they don't think he's really ready yet more than anything. Uh, he's kind of an interior midfielder, and they remain pretty crowded at that spot still. It hasn't been the midfield that's had the injuries. Looking ahead for the Swans, they've got St. Kilda on Thursday out of the bye. The return of Thursday night footy will be for round 13. I'll be watching that from the Eastern Time Zone. Where exactly will you be at that point again? I believe Rockville, Maryland. Suburb of D.C., where some of our cousins are. Luke Parker will be suspended for that game. His dangerous tackle suspension was upheld. It looks like the most important thing in the recent dangerous tackle rulings is whether or not the arms are pinned. So look for that to be a continuing thread if the tribunal is actually consistent, which, I mean, they were consistent in just upholding dangerous tackle suspensions before this. I think that's a fine benchmark. You know, if your arm's not pinned, you can brace yourself more. Well, if the arm's not pinned, I think it'll also depend on the speed of the tackle and kind of if the, the head did hit first. Basically, if the arm's not pinned, you kind of need to pull him down on top of you for it to be okay, it seems like. Or at least slow the motion of it, as we saw with Rory Laird. But Parker didn't do as much of that, and he did pin the arm. After playing St. Kilda, they travel to the GABA, so that'll be fun. Then they've got a free win against West Coast. And then that ending stretch, Geelong round 16, at Richmond, host the Bulldogs, at Frio, they won their last year, and I was really impressed by that. At Essendon, to whom they lost last year in Melbourne, Sydney Derby 25 at the showground, Gold Coast, who knows at that point, at Adelaide's a tough trip, and hosting the D's to end the season. We said from the beginning 
that the Swans probably had the toughest schedule ahead of Geelong, and I think that's held up. Yeah, I'm I'm interested when we get to the end of the season, kind of reevaluating this and seeing you know whose schedule actually ended up being the toughest. And some of it you could also just look at you know things that can't be measured so much mathematically, just like who ran into teams at the wrong times, like you know playing Carlton in an early round, for example, not good. And what kind of trips did they have to make when they had to make those Southern and Western trips in particular? The Geelong games are Friday nighter, and then round 17 and 18, they have back-to-back Thursday nighters at Richmond and hosting the Bulldogs. They and the Bulldogs on Thursday night again? That seems to be pretty common Thursday and Friday night game. And then Dogs have early primetime games too in the next three weeks too. It's returning to last year's schedule just in time. Once again, it's time to ask, what has to happen in this season for you to consider their season successful? And I think this is one where, because of all the injuries and stuff, expectations, it's fair to for them to have changed a bit. It's going to be tough for them to crack top four, let alone make the eight, but I, th- I want to see a finals win from them. I think they can get into form and get healthy at that time. But if not that, if they don't make the eight or if they lose in finals, I'll be satisfied enough if I see more of a long-term plan for them in terms of where some of these younger guys, these first-time inclusions this year, where they slot into the greater plan. I want to continue seeing more out of Lewis Melkin as part of that. I would love to learn more about Sheldrick and Mark Sheather, who they seem to have really backed in as of late. My benchmark for success, I think just crack the eight. If if they don't, I'll understand, but I think as of now, barring, you know, nine misfortunes. But nine misfortunes? I'd like to see that. I think they still have enough talent to at least make finals. I don't care what they do once they get there. I think to get there, it's going to be a tough road. And you you like to be able to get there with, you know, with some level of, you know, ideally you come in with some level of health, you know, resting guys. And they're probably not going to have that luxury. But I think they still have what it takes to be a finalist, as do I. So uh, I guess we'll end with the Saints then. Yeah, for the... Second year in a row, we have underestimated them. Or have we now that the new coach smell has worn off? Well, I thought they were going to be like a wooden spoon contender, and considering they've already won seven games, it would be hard for them to do that. The West Coast Eagles will not win six more games. Worst case scenario, I find it hard for them to finish below like 14th or 15th. Even that is hard to comprehend for me. I can see them, you know, around 12th again, but... As of now, they're seven and four and in fifth, though they're three and four in their last seven. Other than the loss to the Crows, which Ross Lyon gave them a mulligan, there have been no really like embarrassing. We can't compete with these guys losses, though. The loss to Hawthorne is embarrassing in its own right. Yeah, and they they didn't play very well that day. But in between those two, they had a pretty nice win at GWS where I thought They didn't play their best game and they got tested, but they still managed to pull through at the end. Didn't control the pace like they often do. That that game made me think that this is a team that can go farther because they can win when they aren't just playing their game. When they are playing just Ross Bull, controlling possession so much, really slowing down the game. They did some of that in like the final 10 minutes of that game, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, when you're you're preserving the lead late, but in general, Ross Lyon's style seems to be a bit slower and lower scoring than what we'd seen in the past. But this is a team that's capable of pushing the pace of moving the ball well from the defensive 50 to the forward 50. And so I think he's in a good spot with the list, actually, where it's a list that's able to both play slower and faster. So whenever they put out a weird sign on the bench, that says start playing faster, they'll be able to turn the page pretty quickly. Jack Sinclair's been a really nice accelerator, going more toward the center and half forward this year than half back. I think Naziah Wanganin Milleros emergence as a consistent 20 disposal getter there and a pretty decent mark has allowed Sinclair some of that flexibility, although he was one of the lesser performers in that game against Hawthorne. I think we made the mistake of underestimating both him and Jack Steele. I think it's time to accept and understand that Jack Steele is one of the premier midfielders in the game and deserves a lot more credit than he gets. Seems to be a very good on and off field leader as well. He had had a down 2022 in comparison to being joint fifth in the Brownlow in 2021. And maybe we thought that he was on a bit of a decline, though he's still only 27. I'm most impressed, though, that 
the Saints stayed afloat early despite all the injuries that they had, especially to their forward group. All those injuries, doing absolutely nothing in the trade period last year. Hey, Zane Cordy came over after being delisted. That that was it, though. They largely exceeded my expectations for the entire season. And I'm having fun watching them because they've had this young core that's really started to figure it out. You look at the ages of some of their guys, and there are some older dudes still in there, defensively especially. But when you have young dudes up front like your sleeper, Anthony Caminiti, Matthias Filippo, Vincito Owens, Max King is still on the younger side. The King twins are just 22. They'll be 23 in July. They're a little bit older defensively, but I like what they've done. Uh, Dougal Howard and Callum Wilkie have had really nice seasons to this point. Uh, Hunter Clark on the younger side, really liking his game. He's he's not that young. He's 24, but I think he's broken out some. He is one of their currently injured players, though. A knee injury is going to cost him the next month. Looking at their the rest of their injuries, a few concussions. Jack Vitell, Tim Membry, and Mitch Owens. Jack Hayes and Zach Jones have yet to see the field this year from hamstring and Achilles injuries, respectively. And Dan McKenzie's been in and out, but he's got a calf complaint. But, hey, it's looking a hell of a lot better than it was at the start of the year, and they've exceeded our expectations despite the injuries that they had to deal with. Yeah, Caminiti, he's been fun. I realized just what this guy could be watching him a bit in the preseason outing, and he had been thrust into an important role right away considering... King and Membry were out to begin the year, and all he's done in eight games is kick 10-6 and look really at home, make some smart plays outside of goal kicking as well. I noted that he managed to take the ball off Tom Green before a really clutch goal by a teammate against the Giants. The one not-so-clutch thing he did was get Get suspended suspended for... It was three games there. It was, oh, who did he cheap shot? Nathan Murphy. He can gust him. Yeah, that was, that was dumb. That was in a really fun Gather around. game where the Saints managed to get back into it and only lose by a goal. It was like not your normal tight Collingwood win. This one was, you know, the Saints had gotten beaten. You know, Collingwood was clearly the better team. And then St. Kilda managed to only end up losing that game by six because they went on this crazy late push and made him sweat. It was like, you're not going to be undefeated forever. What I would consider like a, a fine loss. Uh, Bytel was my sleeper pick. I think he's done pretty well this year, kind of settling in as a member of their main core. Concussed now. Don't think he's going to be back in time for the Sydney game, but he's been the sub four times in his one actual full game. He had 16 disposals and seven tackles in that round one win over Frio that at the time, I still don't think Frio played well that game. Yeah, at the time, it was like, what the fuck is Fremantle doing? And it looks like a better win at this point. He also hasn't been completely healthy for this year, so he'll get more time. And also, his name is Jack, so he's a clear saint. I think the Saints have caught a few teams on the right day. Frio, obviously, at the start of the year. It's it's happened a bunch of times. I thought it was going to be the case again when Hawthorne couldn't kick straight most last week. North Melbourne, I mean, that game was just hideous, but I think they caught them at the right time. Carlton, turns out that's just Carlton. Suns didn't play well. They caught the Bulldogs playing their worst game possible. Essendon gave them a good fight. That was still, I would have to call that the highlight of St. Kilda's season because it was their anniversary game. They actually played up to it, unlike Essendon did the previous year. It was really funny when Essendon couldn't do that, and yet the Saints played so poorly in Spud's game. There was like nobody able to play up to the expectations, but that hasn't been a theme this season. Uh, looks like their toughest stretch, those final four games, Carlton, Richmond, Geelong, and at Brisbane. That's, I mean, the final two in particular. Yeah, but I mean, and again, who knows what Carlton will look like at that point? Who knows what Richmond will look like? Hopefully Geelong are healthy, not counting on it. It's like all the guys that are hurt now will be back and everyone that's healthy now will be hurt. Probably is how it goes. So given how our expectations of them have changed so much, what would you consider a success for them? Or is this already a success this season? Don't lose any more games to North or West Coast because you already lost to Hawthorne. Don't lose to any of the other bottom three teams. And if you miss finals by one game or whatever, just don't do it in embarrassing fashion like Carlton last year. Just... Or the Saints last year, considering they lost eight of their last 11. Just don't fall in similar fashion. Like, they've been playing really well. 
and have caught teams at the right time, but I never saw this as a final team. If they finish middle of the pack after the offseason they had, I'll be optimistic moving forward. Yeah, remember they had fired Brett Ratten right before the trade period. Their football manager was on the outside, I believe. So they didn't have a great trajectory at that time. So yeah, stay the course, remain competent. I think they'll, they'll slip a bit from where they started, but anywhere between 5th and 10th, I can understand as a reasonable landing spot for them. And I'd be fine with any of that looking at this from an outside perspective. So that's going to do it for the progress reports for this round was a good pace that we did this at and you know only four teams so it's going to be faster because of that only two teams next round will be on it by those being Geelong and Gold Coast but we'll also be ranking the Sir Doug Nichols rounds jumpers in that one just to lengthen the episode and also because we really enjoy talking about uniforms don't forget you can find us on Twitter at Americans Footy I am at Benjamin HK01 I am at Castle Media. Brian Harambe is now sleeping next to me. He is on Instagram at Brian. So this has been the second of three episodes we'll release this week because I'm going to turn around and start working on putting out the round 12 preview. 